What's up boys and girls, C. Lopez back once again with another tutorialism and today I'm going to be looking at rewiring Ableton 10 into Cubase 10. So hopefully if you're watching this video you're either an Ableton user who never uses Cubase or a Cubase user that never used Ableton and I just want to show you really how powerful this rewire function is especially with the updates in Ableton 10 with the push. Now what Rewire does in a nutshell is it allows Ableton to talk to Cubase. Now Rewire isn't a new function, it's been around for a very long time, but for me personally it hasn't been that useful because switching between the two screens, the two DAWs has been a bit cumbersome and just a bit, a bit of a faff really. So why Rewire is so much more powerful now than it used to be is because of the updates with the Push 2 with the introduction of Ableton 10. And what that means basically is we can use all of the functionality of the Push 2 while Ableton is in rewire mode, which previously wasn't possible. So let's start off by showing how we can use the Push to control things within Cubase. So for Cubase users that aren't familiar with the Push, what it is is basically a MIDI controller that can control about 99% of all functions within Ableton without ever having to actually look at the screen which is absolutely awesome. So for again for Cubase users I've got my default Ableton template set up here. I can s I've got four channels uh, audio 4, audio 3, MIDI 2 and the first one which I've got labeled to Cubase and what my two Cubase channel is doing is sending MIDI information to Cubase so we can see that I am triggering notes within Halion Sonic here. So I guess one of the major defining features of the push as a MIDI controller is this scale functionality. So by default, it's playing C major. With these pink buttons here being the root notes. I can't change the color, but anyway. We can hear velocity sensitive, we can change the velocity curve, but I'm not going to get into that. Let's just get back to the scale function. If I click on scale and let's go D flat, playing D flat, go E. Hopefully you can see on the display here that I can change the mod. So I just use these rotary controllers here. Let's go to Dorian, so if my hand was in the way there, and I score F, I was playing F Dorian. We've got all these crazy things like Hungarian minor, and so on. Now I know that people are very passionate about the DAWs that they use. Like people are either like an Ableton or nothing person, or a Cubase or nothing person, or a Logic or nothing person, or whatever. But for me, learning more than one DAW is so powerful when it comes to music production and it just opens up so many different possibilities. Whether you want to admit it or not, there are things that Ableton can do that Cubase just can't do or just can't do as well, I think would be a better way to put it. And there are things that Cubase can do that Ableton can't do as well. So for the Ableton users, let's have a quick look at something that we can use the push to control within Cubase that we can't necessarily do in Ableton. I get confused with saying Cubase and Ableton all the time. Anyway, so let's switch the push to chromatic. So now all the lit buttons represent the white keys on the keyboard and the black buttons represent all the black keys on the keyboard. And let's open up chord pads on Cubase. So now, just by hitting a single pad, we can see that we play a chord. Now, the way that is, this is different from the chord device in Ableton, I mean, there's many, many different ways that this is different, but let's just have a look at maybe two ways for now otherwise be here forever if we look at these kind of white markings here on each chord pad they represent the 
finger position of the chord that's being played. So if I play this C chord, we can see the keys get lit up of the chord that we're playing. Now, keep an eye on this E7 one, and as I play different chords, you'll see that the finger positions change. And that is basically showing that an actual piano player, as he's moving between different, or she's moving between different chords, if they're going to move from an A7 to an E7, their finger in position would be different from if they were moving to a C major to an E7, just because that's just the way their fingers would naturally lie. So let's let's just show that up. Let's listen to that. So I'm going to switch between C and E7 and A and E7 and listen to the E7 and just watch with the way that the, the finger position moves, even though it's the same chord being played, the actual notes that are being, or the actual position of the notes that are being played are different. See that? Pretty cool. Okay, so that's one small way that the chord pads in Cubase are different. Let's dive in a little bit deeper, not too much deeper, or else we'll be here all day. Let's click on this E button, and right now we can see under this section here, player mode says playing chords. That just means every pad we play is just going to play a playing chord. Now, if I switch this to pattern, what we're going to get in effect is an advanced arpeggiator I guess is the the best way I can describe it so let's go import MIDI loop and yeah let's choose a piano pattern and I don't know let's go funky house chorus a let's double click on that and now if I click a pad guess funky house uh, let's try something else let's try Cumberland piano so on and so forth I mean that is just a tiny taster of what this could do this can go so so deep uh, this is a really basic example but we can basically we can record that MIDI into Cubase. We can then move the MIDI into Ableton if you like and do whatever you like with it or so on, so forth, whatever you like. Now the way I like to think about using different DAWs is kind of like the way I think about playing different instruments. Like you can play piano and you're gonna be a good musician if you learn how to do it properly. You can play guitar, you're gonna be a good musician if you learn how to do it properly. But if you learn how to play guitar and piano your the things that you can make uh creatively musically all those kinds of things like the doors are just going to open massively and it's the same with learning different DAWs it's different DAWs have like a different kind of mindset a different kind of workflow and when you combine those two things together and you learn what you can do quickest on each DAW like the the possibilities are just endless and more importantly lots and lots of fun now i know straight off the bat a lot of people are going to be thinking well ableton is crazy expensive i've already bought cubase or vice versa now what i would say to that is think about the cost of individual synth plugins or individual audio effect plugins or individual midi effect plugins and then think about all of the plugins you get within Cubase or within Ableton. If you think about it that way, it's kind of more cost effective than buying all those individual third party plugins in my, well not in my opinion, that's an actual fact. So that's my answer to that little concern. Okay, so let's look at one more function within the push. Let's see how easy it is to add some drums from the push for use within the Cubase session here. So let's click on the second MIDI channel. Let's move a bit closer so my hands aren't in the way. And let's go add device and let's go to 
drums and we can see by selecting them we get a little preview and let's just go something classic let's go with a 707 just simply going to click on load so we can see that the display on the push has now changed the 16 pads that are lit up here is now our drum kit the top section here is our step sequencer and we use this section here to um, determine how long we want our step sequencer to go for so each one of these buttons represents one bar so let's create a two bar loop by clicking these two buttons down now this green light represents our playhead so let's select the snare and we can see when the playhead crosses over the lit button it's going to play that note let's add kick and let's have a look at the note repeat function so got the hi-hat selected I'm going to click on repeat and the interval of the repeat is selected by clicking on these and let's record that in and let's play with the swing so I'm gonna hold down quantize and we can see the swing amount here let's change that to 62 and we're gonna apply that by hitting quantize again and let's go back into Cubase go to these chord pads let's choose a different preset uh, let's try pleasing rock pop chords one see what that is nice so right now i just have the stereo output of ableton going into this stereo channel here on cubase but if i click on rewire just here you can see that i can activate up to 64 channels now i have got this set up so i can move fr so i can activate things from cubase in ableton so what that basically means is I have the option of either using Ableton to control all of my kind of clips and MIDI information, audio information or whatever, or I can do everything within Cubase, whichever is more comfortable, whichever I feel like doing that day. So if I was going to condense into a sentence or two what I use Cubase for and what I use Ableton for. I would say Ableton is good for making beats, working with loops, really good for working with samples and sample manipulation. And Cubase, I would say, is good for writing songs rather than kind of making loops. It's really good for recording live instruments. It's really good for recording like live vocalists, obviously and the mixing environment I just find a lot more user-friendly and a lot more extensive than Ableton's. Now that's not to say that you can't record audio and musicians in Ableton and you can't uh, write songs in Ableton and you can't work with beats and loops and Cubase, of course you can, but for me personally I just find Ableton's strength is in the beats and the loops and Cubase's strength is in the songwriting. Now I know another question a lot of people are going to be thinking is how difficult is it to learn another DAW when you're already balls deep into the DAW you already learn. Now for Cubase users, a few weeks ago I was actually teaching in a school and the kids in the school were like, I don't know, maybe four or five years old up to maybe 11, 12 years old, I don't know. They were young kids and I was showing them Ableton and I would say about 90% of all the kids got the basics in the first five, 10 minutes. I mean, 
it is super, super simple to learn Ableton, no doubt about it. Now for Ableton people who have never used Cubase, I would say Cubase is not quite as easy to master. I mean, it's very easy to use if you've used Ableton. Um, basic functionality is the same. Cubase has been around forever. I started using Cubase back when it was back when the graphics were black and white. So it's been around forever. To master Cubase, not so easy because there's just functions within functions within functions within functions. But for me personally, just the discovery of all those things and learning all those things and finding ways to use those within your productions is so rewarding for me. I mean, I would definitely advise it. I mean, at least try the demo or the light version of either Ableton Lite or Cubase Lite or whatever they call it to start off with for sure. Now I'm going to leave that there for now, otherwise this tutorial is going to go on forever as I show all the millions and millions of different functions that we can now combine together. But from now on, all of my tutorials will be using Cubase and Ableton together. So if that interests you, please like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification button. The next video might not be out for a while because I've got a backlog of tracks that I need to mix down and get sent off. But once that's done, I will promise I promise that I will get back into doing these and I will dive as deep as I can into both Cubase and Ableton rewired together. So that's it for now. C. Lopez, Tutorialism. Peace.